So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Holly and I work for the Bay Programme and we've also got my colleague Yolanda on the call as well um, and we'll be talking well, about sharks of Morecambe Bay. So I just have a few things to go through before we start the talk. Uh, the talk is going to be about 50 minutes long with some time uh, for questions at the end. Um, it is being recorded and uh, will be shared on our website and YouTube. So if you don't want to be recorded, if um, you could just uh, turn your camera off. I also ask that everyone is muted during the talk. So if you haven't muted yourself, if you could do that now, that would be great. Um, if you have any questions, uh, if you pop them in the chat facility and then Yolanda will get to them at the end. And yeah, hope you enjoy the talk. So this evening, I'm going to be talking about sharks of Morecambe Bay. Um, first, giving you a little bit of an overview on the biology of sharks um, and then how they're successfully adapted to their environment. Um, and then showing you some examples of sharks we have on our coasts. So sharks are a type of cartilaginous fish, which basically means that their skeleton is made of cartilage as opposed to bone. Um, and they're one of the top sea um, ocean predators. So it means they're really important in um, kind of controlling the ecosystem. So the balance of different marine species um, and their prey. They are highly adapted to their habitats and they inhabit a range of uh, different places throughout the ocean. So from um, tropical waters, for example, the whale shark, uh, to colder waters like this Greenland shark, uh, they also inhabit really deep seas and deep waters, uh, and some prefer kind of shallow waters and estuaries. You also get some sharks which prefer coral reefs. Um, and quite surprisingly, there are uh, some species of shark that are actually freshwater species, uh, but there's only really a few of these, and it includes uh, this endangered shark, uh, which is the Ganges River shark. So obviously it lives in uh, India in the river Ganges, but these are really rare um, and pretty elusive. So worldwide, there are about 500 species of shark, um, but in the UK, we only really get about uh, 21 resident shark species. So sharks that live here all year round um, and about 10 species that kind of pass through our waters uh, as seasonal visitors. So particularly in the warmer summer months. So the area that I'm going to be talking about is Morecambe Bay. So if you don't know already, um, Morecambe Bay stretches from Barrow and Furness and Walney Island in the north, so in Cumbria, all the way down to Fleetwood in Lancashire in the south. Uh, the Morecambe Bay is a large estuary bay um, and it has pretty uh, shallow water. So the deepest part is about 80 metres. It's mainly a sandy bay. Um, with lots of um, prey, things like sand eels, uh, crabs, mussel beds, uh, lots of smaller, uh, smaller shark, sorry, smaller fish species, which are perfect for our smaller sharks. I am, however, going to talk a little bit about the Irish Sea. So the Irish Sea encompasses Morecambe Bay, and it's the channel of sea that runs from uh, Ireland and Northern Ireland in the west all the way over to the UK in the east um, and with the Isle of Man in the middle. So the Irish Sea is a little bit deeper than uh, Morecambe Bay and reaches depths of just over 300 metres. So we get some different uh, shark species passing through there. So uh, first of all, I wanted to kind of address the elephant in the room when talking about sharks. So people tend to hear the word and have this kind of instinctive reaction that they are quite scary and sort of dangerous animals. Um, so I wanted to ask you all a question. And don't worry, it won't require anyone to speak. So I'm setting up a poll at the minute. Um, and then you'll be able to answer anonymously. Uh, Yolanda, if you're able to um, pop the poll up, if that's OK. Okie doke, so the poll's up here. So which animal is responsible for the most human deaths a year? Hippos, dogs, sharks, snails or snakes? Interested to see the answer to this one. Mm. I'm not sure. 
Have you got that kind of sent out? I can't see it on my screen, so I'm relying yeah, on you to... Yeah, so the okay. results are coming in. Okay, that's good. Results are, are changing a little bit. Ooh. There's more results coming. Okay, so we have got... Uh, everybody's given their answer. Okay. And in first place, it's thought that the most dangerous animal is the hippo. Okay. Followed by dogs. Mm -hmm. Followed by snails and snakes in joint third place. So okay. nobody here thinks sharks are dangerous. That is good. Good news. Um, good how many, what was the percentage of people that said snails? Snails, 7%. Two people thought snails. Ooh. Well, those people are correct. <laughs> so actually... Snails are the most dangerous uh, species of animal on that list. Um, so they are responsible for around 10 to 20,000 human deaths a year. So that's a really strange kind of thing for, to be true. Uh, and this is because they carry a parasite which um, uh, causes a disease called schistosomiasis. And um, please don't ask me to say that again, because it's a hard word to say. <laughs> But yeah, so the next on the list, people, um, well, I think they were right with the second choice. So about 25,000 people a year are killed by dogs. Um, and then about oh, 50,000 people are killed by snakes, actually. So yeah, snakes and then dogs at 25,000. Um, hippos kill about 500 people a year. Um, and then finally on the list, as everyone seemed to uh, know already, is sharks. And I think last year, sharks were responsible for the deaths of nine people. Um, and to put it in perspective with all these other animals, you can see they're actually not really that dangerous. But we still kind of have this perception of um, sharks as being quite scary animals and a real threat to humans. And that's mainly because of how we've been taught to view sharks through the media and film. So they're kind of portrayed as these killing machines that are out to kind of get humans at all costs. Um, so there's this constant message of fear surrounding sharks. Um, and you can see by some clippings here from um, a local kind of UK media sources, the sort of emotive languages that they use and the kind of big toothy images. So things like we'll bite them on the beaches and coming to a beach near you and killer sharks. And of course, that's not true at all. So um, we're not a primary food source for the shark. In fact, they don't like eating humans at all. And they'd much rather stay far away from us. Ooh, if everyone's all right, just to mute themselves, if that's OK. I think there's a bit of background noise. Perfect. Um, yeah, so there's no sharks in the UK that can cause us any harm at all, really. Um, oddly, the only kind of... Um, fatal shark encounter was in 1937 and this was because of a uh, basking shark which is quite strange as they are one of the most gentle kind of species of shark but it was a bit of a freak accident really uh, the basking shark was breaching so jumping out of the water and it accidentally knocked over a boat which unfortunately the people uh, drowned so uh, there aren't actually any fatal kind of bites or attacks from shark but just some uh, kind of unfortunate incidents. <laughs> so really sharks have no interest in us as food um, and are actually pretty amazing creatures. So something that I think is um, quite interesting and what I thought I'd share with you is how they came to become uh, such amazing and well-adapted animals. So um, you may have heard that sharks are older than dinosaurs and that is completely true. So it's thought that sharks came into existence, so evolved around um, 450 million years ago, which is about 200 million years before dinosaurs. So um, sharks are jawed vertebrates, so we have a jaw similar to humans, which means somewhere in our ancient history, um, sharks and humans once shared a common ancestor. And this is thought to be uh, this animal called Acanthides bronii, 
Um, and disturbingly, I can see quite a strange similarity between uh, myself here in this picture than the Acanthides bronae, which is never a very flattering thing to say, <laughs> um, but very not too much uh, similarity with the sharks. But obviously, this was quite a long time ago, so 400 million years ago, and there were lots and lots of steps in between um, evolving into modern day sharks and modern day humans. So this is a very, very simplified view of this. Uh, with lots of steps in between. So the shark stayed in the water, whereas our ancestors left the seas and eventually evolved into us. So how do we know how sharks evolve? And that's really looking at fossil records, so particularly tooth fossil records. Uh, so it's thought that there are about 3,000 different species of shark, which the fossil records show. However, it is really likely that there were a lot more than this, uh, so either the fossil records have um, been destroyed or don't exist um, or are yet to be discovered. So throughout their evolution, they have come to develop uh, lots of strange forms, uh, most of which are extinct today. So this is an example of Helicoprion. Uh, this is a species of shark which existed about 270 million years ago. And you can see this very distinctive jaw formation. So kind of a bit of a buzzsaw formation. Um, and it's thought that they used this kind of strange jaw formation to eat things like nautilus, so these hard-bodied uh, prey. And you may have seen these kind of fossils before, the nautiloid fossils. Um, but during kind of um, hypotheses of what the shark looked like, this was sort of one of the early hypotheses of what it looked like based on its tooth formation. And this was in 1899, which I think is quite an interesting look for the shark. Uh, but in uh, more recent times, it's thought that the shark uh, probably looked like this. Um, the next shark uh, that I wanted to show you was the Stethacanthus. Uh, and this was a very strange looking shark that existed about 365 million years ago. Um, and you can see it's got this um, kind of odd spine brush complex on its uh, back. So replacing where the dorsal fin would have been. Uh, and also this kind of um, rough patch of skin as well on its forehead. So um, scientists don't really know why these were here. Uh, there is a theory that uh, this spine brush area was used for mating because it's only found in male fossils, um, whereas it isn't seen in females. And perhaps this kind of strange uh, part of the forehead was um, made, made the mouth look really big, made it look scary, but really it's just a bit of a guess. Um, so both of these kind of species of shark are thought to have lived around Eastern Europe, uh, North America, and even up to around where um, Australia is. Okay, so sharks have always dominated the top of the marine food chain. But for a brief period of time, they uh, were shared as well by um, other animals, such as uh, marine reptiles. And I have a quick pic uh, little thing to show you, which is courtesy of Yolanda, which is the plesiosaur, which existed about uh, 250 to 66 million years ago. I have a lovely little toy there. <laughs> and also the mosasaur. So you might have seen these mosasaurs on the most recent uh, Jurassic World. Uh, film, um, but they look quite scary. But obviously, both of these species are now extinct. And actually, uh, modern day sharks um, are the only group to have survived. So uh, the sharks which went on to form the sharks we know today. And what that means is that sharks survived all five of these mass extinction events. So, for example, the second extinction event about 365 million years ago, it's thought to have killed off about 75% of marine life. Um, and this really allowed the sharks to sort of proliferate and develop very strange forms, which is where you get these uh, Stethacanthus and Helicoprion sharks evolving. They then survived the next um, mass extinction 250 million years ago, which is thought to have been Earth's biggest mass, mass extinction in history and killed about 95% of ocean life. But some sharks managed to survive this and um, carried on existing and even um, survived 
the most recent extinction event 65 million years ago, which is the KT extinction. And you might have heard of this one as it's the one that's killed off uh, the dinosaurs. So all um, non-avian, so non-bird-like dinosaurs were killed off in this event, and lots of sharks were. However, some of them did survive and went on to kind of become the sharks that they are today. So despite all of these trials and tribulations that the shark has uh, survived through, um, today shark species are um, threatened with extinction. So mainly due to pressures from uh, human activities, meaning that they're one of the most um, vulnerable species and group of animals uh, in, in the world. So I thought I would go through as well some of uh, their pretty cool adaptions and what they've managed to evolve um, throughout their evolution. Uh, so here's just a picture of a typical shark on the left in comparison to a bony fish. So the normal kind of fish that we see like trout, salmon, uh, carp. So if you have a look, you'll see that they have a lot of similarities. So for example, with the different fins, um, but they do have quite a few differences as well. So the main one that I've mentioned already is that sharks have a cartilage skeleton, whereas the bony fish obviously have uh, skeletons made out of bone. Uh, in the shark, um, one way to tell them apart from normal fish is by looking at the gill slits. So these are the areas on the side of the animal here. And in sharks, there are five to seven gills um, on either side of the body. Um, and these are quite wide and are open, so not covered by anything. And this is in comparison to bony fish, where they have one gill slit on either side, which is covered with this flap of skin known as an operculum. Uh, another good way to tell sharks apart is looking at their tail, so the caudal fin. Um, in the shark, this top lobe of the caudal fin is much larger than the bottom lobe, whereas in bony fish, these are pretty much similar size. Um, another interesting adaption is the swim bladder. So there are no swim bladder in uh, sharks. However, um, bony fish have um, an organ called a swim bladder, which helps them keep afloat. Um, and instead in the shark, they use oils in their liver. And it actually uses a bit less energy than having um, uh, a swim bladder. So basically this means that the shark is able to stay afloat in the water, but because these gill slits are open, they need to have a current of water passing through to allow them to breathe. So in a lot of shark species, they need to constantly be moving in order to get oxygen from the water. Um, however, um, they can also stay in currents of water where the water is um, passing through the gills for them. So you think, why do they have these kind of five to seven gill slits and how does it make them sort of more adaptable and better swimmers? Well, um, because they have no operculum over them, it means that they can take the maximum amount of oxygen from the water. Um, and so it kind of increases their energy and ability to move faster. Um, all of these adaptions, so for example, the cartilage skeleton, uh, mean that the shark is quite light in comparison to bony fish of the same size and able to swim uh, faster and are kind of um, more agile in the water. So able to move and change directions um, at quite quick speeds. So I thought I would go through some of the different uh, senses that sharks have. Um, the first of all that I wanted to talk about was its teeth. So unlike humans, where we only have two sets of teeth, uh, our milk teeth and then our adult teeth, um, sharks actually have an endless supply of teeth. Um, and the shark has a kind of conveyor belt like mechanism where they have lots and lots of rows of teeth um, so that when one is lost, it's very quickly replaced by a tooth behind it. And depending on the kind of diet and species of shark, this means that some sharks are able to um, go through about 40,000 uh, teeth throughout their lifetime. So this is one of the reasons why we often find shark teeth washed up on the beach. Um, and it's also one of the reasons why they're um, commonly found as co uh, fossils. Because there's so many of these teeth being lost, it increases the chance of these being uh, fossilized. And it's actually the most common fossil throughout the world. 
So as well as kind of uh, these teeth in the mouth, they also have tiny teeth like structures um, throughout their body. So on the skin. Uh, and these are called dermal denticles. So these dermal denticles kind of all face the same direction. It should actually be flipped because it should be going towards the tail. Uh, but these dermal denticles act a little bit like armor on the shark, so it protects them. Um, it also reduces the turbulence and the drag of the water, so it allows them to move quicker. And it's thought that this arrangement actually reduces the amount of energy it takes to swim by about six to eight percent. Um, they also are really useful in keeping the shark healthy. So these um, arrangements don't allow for the settlement of ectoparasites and um, uh, barnacles. So it keeps the shark nice and healthy as well. Another sense that you might have heard about sharks is their amazing um, smelling ability. So you might have heard that sharks can smell a drop of blood, uh, I don't know, about a mile away or something. Um, and that's pretty much true. Um, so in a recent study, I think they found that um, hammerhead sharks could detect one gram of blood in one billion litres of water. So that's roughly one gram of blood in about 400 Olympic sized swimming pools. So it's pretty amazing ability for the shark. Um, it also helps that the shark has a constant current passing from uh, one side of the nose to the other. So that helps it kind of detect these tiny little particles of smell. So one sense that the shark has that we humans don't is their ability to detect electromagnetic fields. So electromagnetic fields are produced um, by the contractions of muscles, so any kind of muscle movement. Uh, this muscle uh, movement creates an electric field, which is um, put out into the ocean, which the sharks can then sense. So um, for example, if a fish is swimming away, its contraction of its muscles um, is detected by the shark, which is able to kind of hone in and really sort of uh, get to its prey very, very quickly and very precisely. So sharks are able to detect these electromagnetic uh, fields through organs called ampulla of Lorenzini, which is a bit of a strange name, uh, but these ampulla of Lorenzini uh, located in little tiny paws all over the shark um, and are mainly kind of concentrated around the nose and mouth area. And finally, they have another strange ability which is called phonic immobility. So this is a reflex which causes a temporary state of hypnosis or um, kind of inactivity. Um, and there's a few other species that can do this. Um, so one of them is the rabbit. So you might have heard of this uh, rabbit in the headlights. Um, and basically sharks have a very similar sort of uh, condition where if they're flipped upside down, they have this uh, tonic immobility. Um, it's not really sure why sharks have this. Um, one reason some animals have it is um, that it's kind of a defense response. But because sharks are apex predators, they don't really have any other predators um, that would eat them. So they're not really sure why sharks have this tonic immobility. Uh, one reason is it could be something to do with mating, but again, there's still lots to learn about sharks. So speaking of mating and reproduction, sharks have three different ways of reproduction. Um, the first one is by laying eggs. So you may have seen these eggs before if you're going for a walk on the beach. They're very commonly washed up by the tide and left along the strand line. So in all the bits of seaweed that are washed up by the sea. Um, and in each one, there is one um, shark that develops. They're also called mermaids purses and they come in a huge range of different sizes uh, and shapes and colors, depending on the different shark species. So the bodies of these shark cases, which you can see here, are made out of keratin, which is the same as our hair and our nails as well. Um, and they also have these curly tendrils, which you can see on each one of these. So these curly tendrils are actually used to attach to seaweed, um, but this is a picture taken from an aquarium. So you can see it's attached to uh, this artificial kind of uh, seaweed, so people were able to view it but usually they'd be attached to seaweed. 
inside of each of these egg cases is a yolk. So a little bit like a chicken egg and then an embryo in each one of these. And I think you can just about see them in each one of the eggs here. So I've got a quick video. Hopefully you'll be able to see it if my internet's still holding up, um, which is a little shark inside of an egg case. Uh, and you can see the yolk here, which is this dark circular blob and the little shark, which is squirming around and using its tail to kind of move the liquid around inside, uh, make sure it's getting lots of food from this yolk. So um, another way that sharks reproduce is called oviviviparis. And basically that means that these shark eggs um, are inside the mother. They then hatch inside the mother shark and uh, the baby sharks then kind of feed on their unlucky brothers and sisters uh, before being born in a sense um, as miniature adults. There are also some sharks as well which have a placenta called viviparous reproduction um, and this is really strange for animals that aren't mammals so it's quite uncommon for uh, fish to actually have a placenta but some species of shark do and give birth to live young and an example of this type of shark is a uh, hammerhead shark. Right, so now that I've given you a little bit of an overview on the biology of sharks, I thought I'd go into a bit more detail about some of the different species that we have around Morecambe Bay and the Irish Sea. So our most common shark in Morecambe Bay is the small spotted cat shark. And these are nocturnal sharks. So it means that they are most active and hunt during night. And they look like this. So they've got this sandy color with lots of patches of um, darker brown colours and lots of spots. They have a blunt nose and quite a long, thin shape and these very distinctive cat-like eyes, uh, which is hence the name Small Spotted Cat Shark. They did used to be called letter, uh, Lesser Spotted Dogfish, so you may have heard of this uh, name already for them, but essentially dogfish and cat shark are the same animal, but confusingly different names. And you'll see when I go through some more species that there are quite a few sharks with very confusing and lots of different names for them. <laughs> so these small spotted cat sharks are quite small. Um, they can weigh up to one kilogram, but typically weigh about 700 grams and can grow up to a meter, but again, are typically a bit smaller than this. Um, their status is uh, common, so of least concern. There's quite a lot of them around Morecambe Bay as they prefer shallow oceans and seas, um, so are quite happy in our estuary. Uh, there's lots of prey for them, so they like to eat crabs, worms, mollusks, and small bony fish. And they are an egg-laying species. So I showed you the picture of the eggs in the last slide, and these were small spotted cat shark eggs. So this is what they look like, and if you've found any on the beach before, it's very likely you would have seen these. So they come in a range of different colours from this kind of sandy sort of yellow colour all the way to black. I actually have one with me, hopefully you can see that. You can see that it's quite small, especially when it's dried out as well. So our next one is the top. So top are kind of this more typical shark-like shape and is what we kind of think of when uh, when we think of sharks. So they are slightly bigger than a small spotted cat shark um, and have this slim sle uh, streamlined body with this kind of pointed snout and a very distinctive notch tail. Um, they do look quite similar to other shark species, which I'll show you shortly, uh, but a good way to tell a top apart is by looking at the secondary dorsal fin. So this small fin on its back and also the anal fin which you can see on uh, the underside here. And in a top, these are roughly the same size. But yeah, as I mentioned, they're a bit bigger than small spotted cat sharks and can actually grow up to six foot in length. Um, and they can weigh up to about 45 kilograms. So to kind of put that in perspective, uh, the average human uh, woman weighs about 65 to 70 kilograms. So this shark can get pretty big. They are classed as vulnerable, so um, their population is declining around the UK. 
Um, but about 10 years ago, um, or slightly more now actually, uh, the UK released some regulation, which means that um, taupe can't be landed, so they can't be fished and brought ashore. And if you accidentally do kind of um, catch a taupe, you need to release it immediately and unharmed. So um, hopefully those uh, strategies will work uh, to sort of increase taupe numbers. So taupe have quite small, sharp teeth and like to eat smaller um, fish like flounder, mackerel and squid. Uh, this is in comparison with the small spotted cat shark where they like to eat crabs and they have much kind of smaller, flatter teeth that kind of act like a grinding mechanism. But again, neither of these sharks are particularly uh, dangerous or anything to be scared of at all. Um, they actually give birth to live young. So uh, they're the ovo viviparis, which means that their eggs live inside of the mother, um, then hatch out, and then are born as live young. And then moving on to the baskin shark. So this is probably one of my favorite sharks. And I've kind of cheated a little bit because we don't really get them in Morecambe Bay, but you do get them in the Irish Sea. So the baskin shark is this huge, gentle giant. Um, and they're actually the second largest fish in the world, um, second only to the whale shark, which we find in more tropical waters. Uh, so, for example, around the Maldives uh, and in Africa. Um, but the Baskin shark is a migratory species um, and they actually come up to UK waters. Um, so they are absolutely huge. They weigh about 5,200 kilograms and can grow to the size of about 40 feet or 12 meters in length, which is about the size of a bus. They are critically endangered, oh sorry, endangered. So um, their population is declining as uh, they are kind of um, vulnerable to different fishing methods and being hit by boats as well, unfortunately. Um, but despite their size and their kind of fearsome look, uh, they actually only eat zooplankton, which are tiny microscopic um, sort of plankton animals that live in the sea. So I'll show you a video and hopefully you can see this. But this is a video of a baskin shark eating its dinner. So it kind of swim back and, back and forward just along the top of the water with its great big mouth open, filtering out um, all of the zooplankton from uh, the sea. They have a really big dorsal fin, so they can sometimes be mistaken for great white sharks, which is what you'll probably see a lot when you get these sensationalist sort of headlines in the media over summer that great white sharks have come to the UK. Uh, and that um, isn't true, really. It's probably a mistaken basking shark. Um, I'll head back on this one. Yeah. So, yeah, they're most commonly seen in the summer where they migrate up through the Irish Sea. Um, you're probably not going to be able to see them from Morecambe Bay, but they are visible particularly from the Isle of Man uh, and Northern Ireland and also up to Scotland and around the Cumbrian coast. So particularly uh, in the Solway, so from St. Bee's Head, uh, they can sometimes be spotted there. Um, so they thought to come to the Irish Sea to mate, uh, but not much is really known about how Baskin sharks reproduce. I think there's only been one Baskin shark that's ever been recorded to have given birth. And she was uh, located off Norway uh, and gave birth to five pups, all that were about six foot in length already. Um, but it's thought they give birth to live young again by hatching the eggs inside them. But there's still lots to learn about the Baskin shark. Right. So. Now I'm just going to briefly go over some other different sharks that we get around um, Morecambe Bay. The first is the smooth hound. Um, so the smooth hound uh, can be mistaken from a taupe that I showed you earlier. But if you have a look at this secondary dorsal fin and the anal fin, you can see that the secondary dorsal fin here is larger than this anal fin. So it's a good way to tell them apart. Um, they are quite commonly seen around Morecambe Bay as they prefer quite shallow waters and also eat things like mollusks and uh, crabs. We also sometimes get thresher sharks. So these prefer a bit deep water, so more in the Irish Sea. And they're quite an amazing species of shark with this very, very distinctive uh, long top lobe of their um, tail or caudal fin. 
Um, these are migratory species, so they are only really seen in the summer months. And they use this big whip-like tail to sort of round up uh, fish shoals for them to feed on. Uh, they can also breach really high, so they're jumping um, action out of the water. We also sometimes get blue sharks. So these are really common um, around Cornwall and the southwest of England, but are sometimes spotted um, as far north as the Irish Sea. Um, we do sometimes get um, hammerhead sharks around the UK, more so in uh, the south of England, and they are pretty rare now. But hammerhead sharks are quite amazing. So they have this very distinctive hammer-like head shape, hence the name. Um, and this allows them to see 360 degree direction. It also has lots and lots of these ampulla of Lorenzini, which means that they're really good at detecting electromagnetic fields. We then also get angel sharks. So um, these are adapted to live on the bottom of the seabed. Um, but because of that, they're actually really uh, vulnerable to seabed trawling. And while they were pretty common um, around the UK in sort of the 20th century, they're now really rare. So it's not very likely you're going to see one of these. We also have nurse hounds. So these are also known as bullhus or um, greater spotted cat sharks. Um, and they are very closely related to the lesser spotted cat shark, but they are a bit bigger. So they regularly grow to over one meter, um, so about 1.3 meters. Uh, they also lay eggs, so they look like this. Um, they're a bit bigger than the cat shark eggs, the lesser spotted cat shark. And again, I have a little example of one, which hopefully you'll be able to see in comparison to the lesser spotted cat shark. Let's see. So yeah, you can see kind of the difference here. We've got a bit of a big difference there. And these are quite dried out uh, egg cases and usually they would be much bigger than this. So yeah, they're always really good to look out for uh, when you're walking along the beach. Uh, have a look in the seaweed and see if you're able to find some of these bullhus or nurse hound uh, eggs. And finally, I've included the Greenland shark. So this is a little bit cheeky because we don't really see these in the Irish Sea or uh, Morecambe Bay, but they, uh, they are pretty incredible. Uh, and they are found around UK waters. They're very elusive and rare and are typically found further north, so around Greenland. Um, but actually, uh, they can live up to 500 years, which is the oldest um, vertebrate. Um, so one's having a backbone, um, which means that it's possible a shark alive today. So the Greenland shark um, was born in 1522. So it's possible that one was born then and would have lived uh, while Shakespeare was alive and even King Henry VIII, which is quite mind boggling to think that there is a possibility that uh, there's still a shark alive today to see that. Um, but yeah, as I mentioned, they are very, very rare. Um, and don't come into Morecambe Bay because they prefer much deeper waters. Um, but they are sometimes found washed up around our coasts. And I think there was one recently found a few weeks ago, uh, washed up in Cornwall, uh, that had died, I think, from meningitis, which was quite interesting. But yeah, quite strange looking animals, but interesting nonetheless. So next, I thought I'd talk about skids and rays. So these are very closely related to sharks and are essentially sharks that have evolved to live on the seabed. So they're flattened out and able to spend most of their life uh, either buried in the seabed or just resting on top of it. Um, so they like to bury themselves to either hide from predators or to uh, wait for prey passing by. There are about 600 different species of, shark, uh, of skates and rays uh, worldwide, from the huge and graceful manta ray, which we don't get in the UK, but they're more found in tropical waters. And you can see how they use these large pectoral fins as underwater wings. So you can see them glide quite um, gracefully through the water. Uh, to having skates in the UK. So our most common skate in the UK is called the thornback ray. Again, confusingly, it's not actually a ray, it's a skate. Um, and they can be often mistaken for being stingrays, um, but skates aren't uh, stingrays, although they are related to them, 
but they don't have the ability to sting. So they have no venomous spines on them and are harmless. Um, the thornback ray can be identified by this sort of dark coloration with lots of uh, lighter spots. And as the name suggests, they have lots of small thorns along their back and tail. They can grow to be pretty big. So um, up to about 15 kilograms. Um, and can grow up to about 1.3 meters from the tip of the nose all the way to the tip of the tail. Like uh, cat sharks, they also lay eggs, um, but these are a bit stockier than what you would normally see in a cat shark. So uh, skate eggs are quite wide and stocky, and instead of having these curly tendrils, uh, they have these short horns. And again, I've got a little example here to show you. So these are ones that we found uh, just off of Walney in Barrow and Furnace. So this is a thornback ray in comparison to the cat shark. Um, so these eggs are commonly washed up um, and there are lots of thornback rays all the way around Morecambe Bay, but a really good spot to see them or to kind of see these egg cases is in Fleetwood. So at Russell Point, there is lots of um, uh, thornback rays thought to be living around there. Um, these thornback rays, as I mentioned, they live life on the bottom of the seabed and they eat kind of passing crustaceans like crabs, prawns, and also sometimes small fish. Um, thornback rays are listed as near threatened, but I've colored this yellow because um, the populations of thornback rays within Morecambe Bay and the Irish Sea has actually stabilized. And that's thanks to uh, our fishermen using uh, sustainable fishing methods. Um, and some of the kind of uh, regulations which have been brought in, which I'll talk about um, shortly. So they are very rare in the east of the UK, um, but we have quite a good population here. Um, so speaking to kind of local fishermen around Barrow and Furnace and also further north uh, in the Solway, they've said that they believe that there's an increase in uh, the number of, of these eggs being washed up. Um, and they believe that actually the wind farms between um, Cumbria and Scotland, so it's called Robin Rig, um, and also the um, offshore wind farms from Walney, so the west of Walney will wind farms, um, they believe that these are acting as spawning areas for thornback rays. Um, but it's quite difficult to prove until we're able to sort of regularly record numbers of these egg cases which are being washed up. So this is something that you can get um, involved with and I'll come on to that right at the end. So some other species of skates and rays. Um, we have the cuckoo ray. So this is a sandy colored ray with these big kind of fake eye spots and uh, that are sort of white and black. They have a very distinctive um, egg case, which you can see is asymmetrical with these long um, horns at the end. And again, I have my prized sort of example here. So I very rarely get this out because it's quite rare to find them with these horns still in place. And this is in comparison to, you can see the thornback ray. We then also have the spotted ray, um, which as its name suggests is um, spotted. <laughs> they have um, egg cases, which are quite similar to thornback rays. However, they are a little bit more streamlined. Again, I've just got a quick example of this that you can see in comparison to the thornback ray. So you'll see that the thornback ray is a bit wider and has these little bits of um, uh, keels, they're called, in between the horns, whereas uh, the spotted ray doesn't. Um, we then also have the common skate. So the common skate is actually the largest skate species in the world. Um, they grow to about, uh, well, can grow up to two meters across. So from the wing tip, wing tips and can be three meters from the tip of the nose to the end of the tail, which is absolutely huge. Uh, they can also weigh up to about 110, 113 kilograms, which is heavier than um, adult uh, male humans. Their um, egg cases are huge as well. I don't have any of them to show you because they are very rare, but they're bigger than my hand uh, from the ones that I've seen. 
Uh, common skirt used to be very common. That's why they were called common skirts. Um, however, they um, are actually threatened now. So uh, they're very rarely seen um, apart from uh, the top of Scotland. So around the northwest of Scotland is where you're likely to see them. Uh, they used to be all the way around the UK coast. But yeah, now you'd be quite lucky to see these. So what are the main threats that face uh, sharks and skates in the Irish Sea and Morecambe Bay and probably worldwide as well? So the first of these is the obvious one, which is marine litter. And that's become quite a popular topic uh, in uh, recent media. So um, sharks can be affected by marine litter as um, they can become trapped in things like rope or um, hooped kind of uh, plastics. Um, they also might ingest uh, pieces of marine litter and it makes them feel full. However, they're not actually getting any nutrients. Um, one of the main threats to sharks is from overfishing. So um, overfishing is uh, quite a primary threat to um, sharks as they can be caught unintentionally as bycatch. So fishermen will be out looking for other species but may actually accidentally catch um, sharks in the process. Another threat to sharks, so particularly the basking shark, is boat propellers. You can see this rather gruesome image of what's happened to a whale shark, a dorsal fin, after an encounter with a boat. Um, so that's why it is really important if you do see a basking shark um, to maintain a distance, so we say around 100 metres, just to make sure that both you're safe and the basking shark. Um, and another um, big threat to sharks is climate change. So um, sharks are really good at kind of adapting to different um, situations. However, their food isn't. So um, climate change can affect uh, their food availability. So some of uh, the food further down in the food chain, which will then have a knock on effect on sharks. Uh, climate change um, can also affect plankton numbers. Uh, which again will affect uh, the basking shark. On a bit more of a happier note, uh, what's been done in Markham Bay to sort of protect these animals? Well, we have something called uh, the Northwest IFCA, which is the Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority. Uh, I've just showed an example from Kent and Essex, but we do have our own um, in the Northwest. So the IFCA um, are involved in setting rules and regulations to protect marine species. Um, so for example, they set minimum landing sizes. So um, this is the minimum size that you're allowed to catch and um, take home of different uh, animals. So for example, for skates, they have to measure 45 centimetres between the wing tips. And this is just so the animals have enough time to um, mature and breed. And so the fishing methods would then be sustainable. They do have lots of other measurements for different species. So from different crustaceans to different species of fish, which if you have a look at, your, at their website, you'll be able to see a list of there and it is quite in depth. Um, they also um, have introduced laws surrounding fishing methods. So, um, for example, there is now um, a marine conservation zone around the west of Walney, um, which in this area and in Morecambe Bay, you're not allowed to do any trawling. So there is a ban on trawling, which then protects uh, the animals in this area from this quite damaging fishing method. There's also laws on net sizes. So the hole in the net. Uh, it needs to be uh, big enough to allow smaller species and immature species that haven't kind of got to the reproduction age yet, uh, be able to pass through unharmed. Um, one thing as well, it, which um, has been introduced, so not in Markham Bay, but kind of worldwide, is um, longline uh, fishing. So uh, longline fishing is really damaging to sharks. Um, so it's used to catch these larger species like tuna and swordfish, uh, but sharks can be um, caught quite regularly as bycatch. 
Um, so what's been done recently is there is a new technology which fits these hooks with uh, an electromagnetic deterrent. So because sharks can detect these electromagnetic fields, they're the only species that will be able to sense this deterrent. Um, and actually, this has reduced the bycatch by about 80 to 90 percent. However, it is something that has been very slowly re um, sort of reeled out. So hopefully in the future, that will be something that happens more regularly. Um, but luckily, this doesn't kind of affect us in Morecambe Bay as we don't do this type of fishing. Another unique aspect of Morecambe Bay is actually our offshore wind farms. So we have wind farms like the Robin Brig ones up in the Solway coast, but in terms of Morecambe Bay, we have um, the ones west of Walney uh, and Barrow and Furness. And there is also supposed to be some being built just off Morecambe as well. So um, they have some pros and cons for affecting kind of the shark and shark populations. So, for example, uh, in the pros side of things, they actually make a bit of an artificial reef. Um, and this reef supports lots of different types of fish species um, and is able to kind of maintain a bit of a reef system where there previously wasn't one. Um, they may also be used as spawning areas. So, as I mentioned with the thornback rays, they're thought to be spawning areas in Walney and uh, uh, up the coast as well in Robin Brig. Um, but yeah, because you're not allowed to fish in there, that's kind of why they've become spawning areas. So and a sort of unintentional kind of marine conservation zone, which uh, they haven't meant to be, but has worked out fairly well. Um, but there are drawbacks as well to these wind farms. So, for example, when they're being built, it does cause quite a bit of um, disturbance on the seabed. Um, as well as this, you have the cables running to uh, the wind farms. So these cables uh, produce electromagnetic fields, which obviously sharks can um, detect. Uh, and so there is some worry that um, it's affecting their ability to navigate and sense prey. Uh, and there is a bit of a worry that um, it will affect their behavior and physiology. Um, there isn't very much evidence yet about the extent these uh, cables are actually having on sharks. Uh, there is some evidence that it actually causes um, more commercially sort of viable crustaceans like edible crabs to come closer um, but really we don't know the effect this has on sharks uh, so there are currently um, ongoing studies to look into this in a bit more detail so it'd be great to see the results of those when they come out so i thought i would just go over some of the different things that you can get involved with uh, so I thought I would talk about one of our past events with the Bay program of our egg case hunt. So this was conducted in April um, in Walney, Barrow and Furness. And we actually managed to find uh, 3,316 eggs, which was absolutely incredible. I think our last um, kind of egg case hunt, we found about 300 eggs. So yeah, we were really impressed with everyone who came along um, and took part in this. Uh, it did take forever for us to count, but it was definitely worth it. Uh, and these are the different species that we found um, off Barrow. So you can see that there are lots of cat sharks found here. So a small spotted cat shark. Uh, and then, yeah, we have the nurse hound, farmback ray, cuckoo ray and spotted ray. Um, so how can you get involved to help look after our sharks locally and in a sort of global sense as well? Uh, one thing to do is do your own kind of egg case hunt and search. So have a look for local egg cases on your beach. Um, and you can do this just by walking along the strand line um, and recording the different eggs that you see. We have a downloadable kind of recording sheet on our website, which I'll pop the um, address on shortly. But I can also email those out to you after the talk uh, and then uploading that data to the Shark Trust for them to monitor. Um, also, if you do see any sharks, either washed up or when you're out on the sea, if you could report them either to your local wildlife trust or shark trust, that would be really helpful. Um, it is also important to be responsible in your seafood choices. So there's kind of the obvious thing of uh, not eating uh, shark fin soup. So one of the sharks which is particularly threatened by this is the top. Um, it's also called the um, soup fin shark because they are used quite regularly for that. Luckily, not so much in the UK, but it's still good to be aware of and avoid. 
Um, another thing is avoiding harmful fishing methods. So I mentioned this long line um, fishing method being quite harmful and Atlantic bluefin tuna is caught by this method. So a good kind of alternative is to go for albacore tuna, which is caught by line and pole, which is a bit more sustainable. Um, you can also help by ensuring there's less marine litter. So either by uh, taking part in a litter pick that's organized or doing a 10 minute litter pick um, when you're going out for a walk, um, as well as this being able to kind of reduce the amount of single use plastics that you use and reuse when possible. But here are some of the events that we have coming up that you can kind of join in on in a sort of uh, more organized way. So one of these is uh, the Shore Search. So this is happening up uh, in Lancashire, uh, not end. And we use so uh, Shore Searches to kind of survey an area of the shore um, to have a look at the health of the coast in that area and the different populations of all the different animals and seaweeds there. And these are also really important prey for um, shark so you're very unlikely to see a shark in uh, the shore search but uh, all the information we get is really useful for anything up or down the food chain uh, we also have a couple of coastal walks and events happening in st bees so up the coast in cumbria uh, we have a walk from whitehaven to st bees on the 1st of june and then a sea watch survey at st bees on the 11th of june um, sea watch survey you might see basking sharks in that but I'm not going to promise anything, although I did last time I was at St. Bees, I seen some bottlenose dolphins. So it's a really good place to spot wildlife in St. Bees. Um, we also have a shore search with myself and Yolanda on the 18th of July down in Barrow and also a beach bingo event and another one of our big egg case hunts. which will hopefully get lots of different egg cases there in Barrow as well. I'm not sure that we'll be able to beat our last record of uh, over 3,000, but can definitely give it a good go to uh, see what we find there. So to book, uh, head to either the Bay or Cumbria Wildlife Trust. Um, and if you want any more information, then uh, just contact me um, and I can help you out there. So thank you very much for listening. Got a little video of some baby uh, skates there. Um, if you have any questions, if you pop them in the chat, uh, Yolanda will then answer them, uh, sorry, read them out to me and I'll answer them. Or maybe Yolanda will as well, depending on how she's feeling. <laughs> so thank you for listening. Yeah. Thank you very much, Holly. Um, I won't be answering the question. <laughs> um, we have had one come in already um, yeah. from Barry, um, who's asking, have there been any surveys of life around the wind farms? I know that boat access, um, so diving is restricted. So do we have any direct evidence of, of benefit from the farms? Um, not directly. So they are quite difficult to get to because of these cables. So they're not massively keen on people kind of like us kind of going into it, but you do get people going onto the boats which are heading out to the wind farms, which will look out for things um, as they're sort of going along. Um, it might be something that they're able to do in future, so particularly with the wind farm companies themselves. Um, but yeah, as far as I'm aware, a lot of it's anecdotal. Um, so from speaking to people who are out on the boat or by fishermen close by, which again is a bit of a, an issue really. Um, there is some reports of um, like the crabs that I mentioned, um, them being attracted to uh, wind farms. So there has been some studies done, but not in our local area. So these were kind of further either in America or further down south. Thanks. Um, we also have another question come in from email mm -hmm. um, asking, why is it that sharks have managed to survive so many mass extinctions when many of the species didn't? What's their secret? Yeah, oh, that's quite a, an interesting question. Um, so yeah sharks have kind of survived all those different um extinction events because they have the ability to inhabit all those different environments within the sea so from really deep water species to coastal species um, they also eat a huge range of different prey so all the way from plankton up to things like seals and whales so it means that because they're so diverse they are able to adapt if there are any changes in the sea um, another reason as well might be because um, sharks have the kind of unusual ability to be able to reproduce asexually. 
So that means a female by itself can actually reproduce without a male being there. So um, that's basically the egg of the shark is fertilized by the egg next to it. So they don't need a sperm. They kind of merge cells together and this produces baby sharks without the need for a male shark, which means if lots of the species have been dying out, they're able to have this very um, quick kind of survival instinct to do this. So it doesn't help the sharks in the long run because you're reducing the diversity, but it is good if you need a quick fix <laughs> for getting more species of shark out there. Ooh, I've just seen one saying, Oh, Yolanda, are you able to read them? I think yeah, um, from me. <laughs> I might even be able to answer this one. Uh, what's the what are the sharks called that live for up to five hundred years? Uh, Greenland shark. Yeah, Greenland shark. So a bit like the country. It's where they get the name from. Um, but yeah, they're amazing. There was loads of different facts that I didn't have time to say about them. But if you've got time, give them a Google because they're incredible. Uh, some people actually eat them, but. Uh, they're very poisonous to humans because they have uh, like an antifreeze sort of material in their blood to allow them to live in such cold waters. So it is poisonous, but then people soak it in alcohol just to eat it, which does not sound appetizing at all to me. Um, we've got a question. What's your favorite shark? Ooh, difficult one. I think whale sharks are my favorite. So I've seen them when I was diving in Mozambique and they were, yeah, it just took my breath away. They were so cool. Yeah, they're the, the largest species of shark in the world. Uh, so with the basking shark is the second largest. And another question from Peter, has a hammerhead shark been seen this far up north? Do we get them around Cumbria? Not as far as I know. Um, there might have been, but it hasn't been reported. But uh, as far as I'm aware, they have seen been been seen further down south, so up to as far as maybe uh, kind of Bristol Channel, Wales, that sort of area. But that would include them because I don't really think many people kind of see them as being a UK species. But yeah, I was kind of cheating a little bit putting that one in. But yeah, I do like hammerhead sharks, and you do get them sometimes in the UK, but they are becoming more rare. So. Anytime anyone sees any sharks, it's always good to report it. Okay, so that brings us to eight o'clock and I think the questions seem to have stopped coming in. Um, I should just good. say the shore search is on the 28th of July, actually. Um, okay. That's the date, that one rather than the 18th. Okay. Um, oh, we've got one last question. What's the best way to see sharks in the Irish Sea? Um, if you're able to um, get to the Isle of Man or Northern Ireland, um, or even Ireland for that matter, if you go kayaking, that's meant to be really good to be able to see basking sharks, but obviously do keep a good distance away from them. Uh, they can breach, so they're the biggest species that can breach, so propel themselves out the water. So it's best to keep a good distance away from them because you don't want to be accidentally capsized. Um, they are harmless, though, so... But yeah, best to keep a distance for your safety and them. So I'd say kayaking in those sort of areas, possibly scent bees as well. Um, diving or snorkeling. So I've been snorkeling in the Irish Sea and seen quite a few um, small spotted cat sharks. Um, so that's a good way. Um, also just being out on the on boats as much as possible. Um, yeah, if you're able to kind of get out there. I think um, from Barrow, we have um, Peel Ferry, which do organise seal tours but there is always the possibility of seeing sharks on those as well. So having a look for kind of local um, local boats and sort of trips going out into the sea there. But yeah, snorkeling, kayaking, boat trips, good way to see them. Sounds right. perfect. I'll see if I can spot a shark this summer. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to go snorkeling. I think that's something we're hoping to do with the Wildlife Trust eventually. So keep your eyes out for that. Right, I think we'll kind of wrap up now. Uh, we'll be putting this talk online shortly. Uh, so yeah, you'll be able to come back and have a look at that if you're able to. So yeah, thank you very much, everyone. I uh, hope you have a good evening. And yeah, hopefully our internet stayed well as well. Thanks. <laughs>